Hello everyone, I'm Nadir Akhtar. And I'm Saru Chintakrindi. And we're back with the week three FAQ. So what exactly is SHOT-256 and where does it come from? Well, this is a good, very good question. So let's start off with what SHOT-256 is. SHOT-256 stands for Secure Hash Algorithm 256. It's part of the SHA family, which is developed by NIST, which is the National Institute for Standards and Technology in the US. Now, what SHA-256 does is implement a cryptographic hash algorithm. And to better understand that, let's break down the word. Algorithm means a process that takes in a set of inputs and produces some set of outputs. A hash algorithm specifically takes in an input of some arbitrary size. Now, it's not truly arbitrary, but it's some massive value that's so large we probably won't even hit it, like 2 to the 160 bits of input. And from that input, it'll generate some output of fixed size. A cryptographic hash function, or hash algorithm, is a process that does what a hash algorithm does, but instead it is bound by those properties of collision resistance, pre-image resistance, and second pre-image resistance. And the difference between a hash algorithm and a hash function is, just, is very small. They're basically the same thing. The algorithm is the process, and the function is the abstraction of that process. And where it comes from, it was developed by NIST in collaboration with the NSA in order to make a new standard because cryptography is always evolving. You may have heard that SHA-1 was recently deprecated, and someone managed to create a collision in it. And as we know, if a hash function has collisions, that's a big issue. Saroj, what are the different types of wallets? And of them, which is the most secure? So as you might recall, a wallet's basic function is to store all your private keys for you so that you can make transactions with them later. And so uh, wallets generally, their wallets are separated into two ca main categories, hot and cold wallets. Hot wallets are wallets that are connected to the internet in some form or another. For example, uh, the way that Coinbase stores your, your private keys would be a hot wallet because Coinbase has uh, stores all your keys for you and it's connected to the internet. Um, another example would be MIST, Ethereum's official wallet client. Uh, it stores all your private keys and it's connected to the internet to do so. Um, uh, the other type are cold wallets, and these generally take the form of some, some sort of hardware. Um, an example would be the Tresner Nano S, which stores all your private keys on a USB. In cold wallets, your private keys never access the internet, so the possibility that someone can hack it or access your private keys, keys is greatly reduced. So to talk about which, which is the most secure, um, cold wallets are almost always going to be more secure than hot wallets since they're not connected to the internet, the possibility of hacking is greatly reduced. Obviously, uh, the most secure of the t cold wallets would be, well, you might have heard of this, the brain wallet, which is essentially just memorizing your private keys um, using a mnemonic of some sort. Um, this is the most secure since as long as you don't tell anybody, no one's ever going to uh, hack your private key from your brain. Uh, however, this only works is if A, you chose a really complex private key in the first place, and B, you have a really good memory and you can ensure that you're never going to forget your key. So what's the Coinbase transaction? And what's the Coinbase nonce? Right. The Coinbase transaction is the me mechanism by which Bitcoin are minted. Every miner, when they produce a block, will first produce a Coinbase transaction. And what that means is that this first transaction is going to be what gives the miner both a block reward and a transaction and the transaction fees of all the transactions. And this is how new Bitcoins are minted. You might ask, well, how could it be that this new Bitcoin isn't being drawn from any old Bitcoin? Well, remember that the protocol we can design however we want, and we designed it, we being sort of the Bitcoin community, designed it such that the first transaction in every block must be the Coinbase transaction, and any reward or transaction fees can come from nowhere. Right? There's no address from which it's coming, but it's still redeemable. Uh, fun fact, it can only be redeemed after 100 blocks, or about six hours. Yeah, and this is, uh, there, there are other reasons for this, but the important part is that this is where all the money comes from. And then using a locking script, it looks like any other UTXO, and the miner can redeem it after that locked period of time. Now as for the Coinbase nonce, keep in mind we just said that there's some empty data that this Coinbase transaction has because there's no sender, there's no you know, information there. What we can do is increment that value every time we run out of options for the header nonce. Keep in mind that when you're mining, you have a puzzle, and this puzzle is iterating through nonces to see all the possibilities until you finally find a valid header. Let's say we've iterated through all the possibilities of the header nonce, but we still haven't found a valid solution. We then need to change the puzzle or we'll be out of options. 
So to do this, you could modify the timestamp, or you could modify the Merkle tree, or the Merkle root. And you modify the Merkle root by modifying transaction data, and the easiest transaction data to modify is the Coinbase nonce. You increment it by one, so it goes from zero to one. You've changed the transaction data, you've changed the Merkle tree, which changes the Merkle root, which changes the hash puzzle. And from there, you have a completely new puzzle, iterate through all the header nonces again, and then change the, change the, header, the Coinbase nonce again and keep going through that cycle until you finally find a block. All right, Saroj, what's a Merkle tree? And why is it even a tree in the first place? Good question. So in computer science, a tree refers to a data structure in which you have nodes which store information that are connected to other nodes in a particular way. So in a tree, you, you have the root all the way at the top, which, is, which has children nodes. Um, and those children nodes have the possibility of having further children nodes. And that's how these nodes are connected in a tree. Um, the bottom layer, uh, which have no further children, are called the leaves. Um, so a Merkle tree is a, a type of tree. The bottom layer, the, the leaf nodes, are transactions. And then these transactions are paired up together and hashed to create the next higher level of the tree. Then that level, in that level, the pairs of transactions are hashed together again. Uh, to create the next level, and so on and so forth, until you yield up to the one single hash, which is called the Merkle root. The important thing to recognize here is that this is a summary of the transactions, because the Merkle root is generated using the transactions as, as inputs. If you change the transactions and hash them together, then you're going to get a, a, di a completely different Merkle root. So what exactly is a signature, and what does that look like in Bitcoin? Good question. A signature is the thing you use to sign off on checks. And while I'm mostly joking, it's not actually that incorrect or that irrelevant. A signature is some symbol that you, an entity, use to give approval. Like on a check, you say, I approve this money to be sent to X person. Now, if you abstract away the signature part with your hand, you get that a signature is a piece of information which demonstrates approval. It's a unique stamp of approval that allows something to happen. That should only be able to be done by you. For example, if you have a Bitcoin transaction and I want to sign off on it, I know that my private key is owned only by me and it represents only me and no one else has my private key. In order to show that I alone approve the transaction of some Bitcoin from one person, myself, to another person, Saroj or anyone else, then I use my private key to generate a signature. And what that looks like in the Bitcoin protocol is that you combine your private key with the transaction or message data and through some fancy elliptical curve stuff, you get a, you get this output, which is the combination of the two. Now, Saroj, if he's receiving the transaction data, the transaction combined with the private key, he can then see, using my public key to decrypt it, whether or not the transaction data he got matches the transaction data that was sent to him. If they match, that means that I must have intentionally signed it with my private key, and because the private key's encryption can be decrypted by the public key, then he can check whether they match. If they don't match, then he knows that I wasn't the one who signed it or that there was some issue with the transaction data. Either way, that the, that the transaction should not go through.